Goedemorgen allemaal. Goedemorgen. Lekker geslapen? Nee. Mooi. Nederlands? Engels? Oh. Engels. No, 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 no. Yes. No, no. Yes. No. Tradi We are very tra inclusive. No, no. Tradition is 15 minutes in the talk, we switch to English. No. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. Good morning, y'all. Y'all. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce to you Misha Peters, and he will talk about the OpenBSD hypervisor. Please come in and enjoy his talk. Welcome to the Church of OpenBSD. This is going to be a semen sermon. No. Uh, I'm going to talk about the OpenBSD hypervisor. A uh, little bit about myself. Um, I started working at Access for All a long time ago. Walter was there a little bit earlier, I think. Um, and since 98, I've been working for uh, vendors, uh, networking, security vendors, uh, all these kind of things. Um, and also around that start, I uh, also around that time, I started with FreeBSD. Um, I think I was one of the ones that introduced FreeBSD to Access for All. Um, and also after that, I started co-location, um, primarily for my own hardware. Um, I rented a rack with three friends, I thought, and then one of my friends said, no, I'm not going to do it. And, and I was the main contractor, and I thought, okay, shit. Now I have to get other hardware in there. Um, and that exploded a little bit into eight racks or 10 racks at one point. Um, still hosted at Access for All, so I'm looking for a new home um, when it's becoming KPN. But anyway, what about you? Who is using OpenBSD? Ooh. Any other BSDs? Free BSD? Dare I say net BSD? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Who's using the OpenBSD hypervisor? All right. Nice. Who has a VM at OpenBSD Amsterdam? Oh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I know you. I know you. All right. Cool. So it is like a, a, a team customer meeting. All right. So um, I'm going to talk to you about how it all began, um, and I'm going through the, the setup. You can also uh, read about the setup on my website. I've got everything documented, uh, uh, some things that other people have already started using, so that's quite cool. Um, but how it all began was I started using jails on FreeBSD, Kubernetes, and Docker. That's now um, on to, to segment things out. And I've always been looking for virtualization uh, or easy virtualization. Um, then came along Beehive on FreeBSD, which is not simple. It works. Um, but then some guys on the OpenBSD community uh, uh, thought, okay, uh, we're not going to import Beehive. We're going to build our own from scratch. Um, and that became v VMM, VMD. Um, and as a uh, uh, start, uh, I looked at that, and it was getting there. I think after two years, it became a little bit stable. So. I thought, okay, let's, uh, let's do this, because I have some spare rec space, uh, some hardware, more importantly, some spare IP space, IPv4. Um, and I also always wanted to have like a domain with something BSD in there. Um, so I, I, I saw that openbsd.amsterdam was free. Um, I registered, no idea what to do with it. Um, but I also wanted to have a way to give back to the community and to actually take this hypervisor and see how, how far we, we could take this. Um, so. That was pretty much the, the, the start of it. So where is it? As you might assume, it's in Amsterdam. Um, it's in a uh, KPN data center, uh, DC2, at the Barbara Strozzi line, if people know it. Um, it was called something different, which I forgot now. Um, and primarily, the hardware that I'm using is uh, Dell R610s. Um, foundry switches, if people still know Foundry. Cool. Um, and also, um, and that's connected to a Foundry MLX, and I'm doing BGP to, uh, to Access for All, so I can decide where the traffic goes, and if part of Access for All collapses, then I'll go through, uh, through the other gateway. Um, so the whole thing actually started on Twitter, um, where I just started playing around. Um, um, I said to some people, hey, I have a machine that I'm playing with, who wants a, a VM? Um, so I have one of the, the first that, dare I say, victims, <laughs> I guess? Happy customer. Happy customer, okay, cool. 
uh, um, on, on server one, so uh, uh, VM number six was there, and I thought, oh, this is pretty cool. Um, so I, I did a little poll on Twitter what people were willing to pay for, for a VM uh, um, with, with these specs. So uh, 512 of meg, 50 gig of RAM, V4 and V6. Um, because there's a lot of companies out there that do this en masse, and they charge like two euros or six euros or 10 euros or whatever. Um, so I thought the sweet spot was around five euros, uh, five euros a month. So I thought, okay, I have some other spare hardware. Let's, uh, let's get going. So this was the first proper machine online, and the reason why I say proper, the first machine was like 8 gig, CPU, a lot. So as soon as I started adding more VMs, it would reboot, because it couldn't really deal with the memory. Um, so this machine had a little bit more memory, uh, more disk space, um, and this is still running 45 VMs, if I'm correct. Um, and of course, the whole idea was that as soon as you have a VM, part of, of um, the money that I charge, I donate to the OpenBSD community. So the first donation that I've done was in, I can't read it, in July, I think, yeah, end of July, um, to the OpenBSD Foundation. Um, this was for 400 euros, and so that pretty much means 40 VMs, so I donate 10 euros for every VM um, and 15 euros for every renewal. Um, and, and this actually took a while to deploy, so everything was done by hand. Um, also, one of the machines crashed, so I had to redo everything by hand, uh, which was not fun. There were no, no tools around it to make it easier. Um, I developed them gradually over time, um, which you'll see. Um, but yeah. So now, some statistics. The last month, I donated 395 euros, in total uh, 5,000 plus. Um, and in 2018, I donated 1,850 euros in six months, actually, uh, 2019, 3,500. Um, and there's 10 active hosts at the moment, so 10 servers. And what I've done is basically for the money that I made of all the VMs on, cer on a certain server, I bought a new server and started over again. Um, so and I actually have to start investing in, a, in server number 11. Um, and there's currently 334 uh, VMs um, active, which is mind-boggling still. I don't know why people do that. Even pe who's running production on OpenBSD Amsterdam? <laughs> Good. <laughs> Thank you. But there are actually people running production, um, which is a little bit scary. Uh, yeah. So. Um, what do you get? You get an opinionated VM. Now, this has changed a little bit over time. Um, initially, it was more like, this is the, the, the install that you get, these are the packages that you get. Um, but now, there are some changes in the way that OpenBSD upgrades, and it doesn't make sense anymore to not install certain things. Um, so it's going to be more vanilla OpenBSD, but anyway, still my opinion. Um, and you get, by default, 5.12. Uh, mega RAM, you can get more if you want, one gig. Uh, you get 50 gig of disk space, you can also get more. You get one IPv4, you can get more, not a lot of people have done that. Um, and you also get a IPv6 uh, range. And the idea is that the host, not for all, is the gateway for all the VMs. So, how is this uh, set up? Um, everything that we, yeah, 99% today, uh, that we use is in base. Um, so OpenBSD has a very complete base operating system. You can run a router, you can do BGP, uh, uh, web servers, load balancers, without installing anything. So it's, it's quite cool, actually, that most of the things that we can uh, do and use to deploy is, uh, is within base. Um, Perl is in base. Uh, some of the, the tooling that the OpenBSD guys wrote um, are actually done in Perl. So I thought, eh, I know Perl. Um, so I started uh, actually doing some deploy scripts in Perl. Um, and of course, uh, the VM, uh, VMD daemon, DGP, um, auto-install, for people that know it, it's a way to actually automatically go through the installation process. Um, there's a uh, package called site.tgz 
um, which you can um, have your own packages or, or configuration that you can automatically take. Um, I'm using the HTTPD from, uh, from OpenBSD, and then, of course, VI. Everything's done in VI. Um, so what the Perl script does is it will create all the configuration files that are needed. It will create a user. It will put the user in the duas uh, config. So for people that don't know OpenBSD, uh, duas is the version of sudo on OpenBSD. Um, because like everything else, the guys from OpenBSD go, OK, this sucks. It's way too complicated, uh, way too many attack services. We will write our own. Um, which is also what, what Duas is. Um, and it also creates uh, the image. Um, then, so the, the, the vm.conf uh, looks a little bit like this. So I have a, a block of, of, uh, um, of configuration. No, my doesn't show up. Um, where I specify the VM name, uh, who the owner is, uh, where the disk is located, uh, how much memory, how much disk space. Um, and I assign a static MAC address. Uh, to a VM, which I then use in the DHCP config to actually tie the IP address together. So you can type in your IP address manually. Um, if I have to move your VM, it's a little bit annoying for me, um, because then I cannot really reassign your IP address back um, if, if something is changing or whatever, or gateway. Um, and also, the uh, file name auto install basically tells OpenBSD to look for a PXE boot and then uh, an installer file to kick in the automatic uh, process. Uh, one thing you can also do is say auto upgrade. So if you want to upgrade from there on to, uh, uh, to, to other uh, releases, uh, you, can do you can also do that in automatic uh, fashion. Um, so what the auto install looks like, it's primarily um, IP address, username, password, uh, um, so that I can provision the VM. Um, I also uh, uh, put the SSH uh, key in there so that you don't need to have a password in order to, uh, to connect. And also the, uh, the install file. So as you can see here below, set name. Um, I remove all the X things, um, and then I add uh, the site uh, for, the, for the local configuration. Now, if people are familiar with um, OpenBSD, there's now a command called sysupgrade which basically upgrades the whole system with one command, and it assumes that everything will be installed. So removing certain sets these days doesn't really make a, a lot of sense anymore. Um, then the, the site config, what I do there is to basically, uh, as soon as you want to install any packages, um, that's the install uh, URL, so cdn.onbsd.org. Uh, um, that so as soon as you say package add something whatever, um, it will get the uh, the packages from there. Um, I also tell the VM to not use sound because um, there's no need, um, and also to uh, uh, to set the clock um, as soon as it boots. Now for uh, the people that are familiar with OpenBSD, that flag will go away. It's deprecated, um, so they are doing some some clever stuff on the back end. So that might no longer be needed. Um, as soon as the upgrade runs, you have the ability to also run sysmerge, and it merges configuration files. Um, and what I've noticed is that if people don't pay attention, uh, the TTY's file gets overwritten, and the default settings for the console are uh, 115 uh, uh, to connect. Um, the default in TTY's is 96. So what happens is that people go, OK, I cannot really reach my console, or it hangs and it consumes a lot of resources. Um, so this was uh, uh, one of the, the reasons why I put that in, so that as soon as you run the system upgrade, uh, it will not overwrite that, uh, that specific file. Um, and one of the things that I've added in the, in the last couple of days is that, uh, for the people that know hi uh, him, Job Snyders, no? He's uh, from the, yeah, OK. He's from the from, uh, NTT, NLNOG. Uh, um, he also has a VM, and, and um, since we started, so OpenBSD does, does a major release every six months. And during those six months, you have like Aretta, and you get updates on certain packages, and some of them are quite needed, uh, like security patches. Um, and he complained, saying, hey, if you roll this out, just give me all the sys patches so that it's not vulnerable. And I'm, oh, okay, that's a good idea. Um, so what this does, it will actually um, tell the or the installer will tell the system as soon as it boots for the first time, run all the sys patches. Um, it's not a default thing, so this uh, this had to do uh, uh, install that site basically tells it to add it as soon as the installer is done, and then as soon as 
the machine boots for the first time, it runs rc.firsttime, and then in RC local it will run that code. And if it's if it's done installing, it will actually reboot, um, because otherwise some of the security patches are not applied. Um, so that's now uh, now there. So as soon as you get uh, a VM now, you get not only like the the, um, the install or release, but you get actually all the the patches applied uh, uh, to it. Um, I'm using HTTPD, as I mentioned, um, to serve all the, uh, the installer uh, files. Uh, a very simple configuration, just for kicks and giggles. Um, I'm using sensors D to basically tell me when a disk is broken, um, which is quite useful. It doesn't do that by default. Um, so this basically checks if the, the rate is still intact. If it's not, it will send me an email, quite useful. Um, also, when a machine reboots, it tells me, hey, disks are OK. Um, so how does it actually then work to deploy a VM? What I've done is every single machine has a block of configuration that tells it what the IP space is, uh, what the IPv6 is, the start IP address, um, the VM config, what the default VM config is. So if I need to change it at a later stage and say, okay, everybody gets one gig, for example, I can very easily do that. Um, so this is a file that I have per, uh, per host. And what then actually the flow is, you can register for a VM on the website. You can put in all your details. I'll show the form. Um, I run the Perl script that does everything. Then I restart DHCPD. I reload the VM config, and I start the VM. Um, and since two months, I still had to hit A to, do, to start the auto installer. Um, that got a little bit old, so I, I, I fixed that. Um, so the form looks a little bit like this. You can put your, your details in. Um, I get like a nice text file that I put in a text file on the, on the host. Uh, the deploy script is run. Um, it will create the auto install. It will create the user. Um, it will create the actual image that is being used to, uh, to install. Um, then I said I, I reload a VM. I restart DHCPD. And then I start uh, the VM directly in console mode. And I hit A. Um, as I said, that got a little bit annoying um, because then you also have to wait until it's done, shut it down. Um, so I thought, okay, this can be done better. How can I do this? TCL. So I have a, a, a wrapper script that actually does all these steps and it kicks in two TCL scripts that look a little bit like this. If people uh, are not familiar with TCL, it's a great language. Um, so it actually connects to the console, it will wait for a certain prompt, and it will hit A for me. <laughs> Win. Um, once that is done, it will actually um, exit the, um, uh, the script. And then since this is run in the, in the shell script, it will kick in the next expect script. Um, and that will actually wait for... The, the, the fresh reboot of the VM, and it prompts a login prompt, and then it will say, success! So I get a nice beep in Tmux as well, so I know, okay, VM is done. So I don't have to wait for it. So one of the things that I still have in mind is that the VM will actually send you an email when it's done. So that's, that's the goal. So the VM will actually tell you, hey, I'm done, you can now log in. But I, uh, yeah, it's a little bit trickier. Anyway. Um, so. During this whole process, of course, we found a couple of things that were quirky, or uh, uh, as I also put on the website, it's in active development. Things break, and things do break. Um, but other things were also, when I started, one of the things was, uh, I asked on Twitter as well, so what do you need if you have a VM somewhere? Um, and someone said, console access, and I went, okay. Yeah, that doesn't really work at the moment because the person that can actually connect to console is root. Or you have to be in the wheel group, which with a, peop with a bunch of people that I don't know on a host, adding them to the wheel group, mm, that's probably not a good idea. Um, so one of the first things that I, that I did was talk to uh, Reich. Uh, 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 he's one of the, the OpenBees developers, did HTTPD, really the uh, uh, crazy German. Um, so I said, hey, how can we do this? Uh, people need to connect to the console. So, yeah, okay, yeah, that's uh, actually interesting. So now you can set the, 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 the socket owner. 
So you can say, okay, who owns the socket of VMM or VMD? Um, you can specify that to be a group, so whoever is in that group can actually connect to that socket. Um, and then in the VM convic, you then specify the actual user that can connect to that VM. So not everybody can connect to everybody's VM. You can only connect to your own VM, but you have to be in a specific group. So that was quite cool. Um, one of the other things was, is for a VM to boot, it needs to have a tap interface into uh, the bridge. By default, there's only four tap interfaces on OpenBSD. Um, and it gives you a very peculiar error message when there's not enough tap interface. Just says, well, I cannot start. Well, okay, why? Um, so that took some while, actually, to figure out what was going on. So what I, by default, do is just create 50 tap interfaces, so that's not no longer a, a problem. Um, for people that don't know, Jot is similar to SEC in uh, Linux. Linux people here? All right. Okay. Fine. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. But <laughs> hoot! Um, all the Dutchies here. Um, the other thing that you can do with Jot is it can also cycle through characters. Um, so one of the things that I do to create like a random password is actually to use Jot assign ASCII. Um, so 33 is uh, is uh, 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 um, uh, exclamation mark and uh, 126 is tilde. So everything between that I use to generate a password um, that is 20 characters long. And what I do is I shove that uh, generated password into um, authorized keys at the end as a comment. So that you can log in with your SSH key um, and then take the, the, the your password and the root password out of the... Uh, um, out of authorized keys. And, and Reich actually thought that was a good idea, so he started using that for his deployment on uh, um, Azure or AWS or something, I don't know. Some cloud giant, I guess. Um, so I thought that was quite cool. Sometimes I do think of clever things, not always. but. Um, so one of the things that was a little bit annoying is if you have 40 VMs running on a machine to start them all the time and to stop them all the time. So uh, um, enter a for loop with awk um, and a sleep that basically says, okay, after 30 seconds, then the next one and then the next one, because if you do it too quick, um, it might screw up your disk and you have to ha hang an FS check. Um, so that's that's no fun. So they, they figured that out and they went, okay, yeah, that's not a good idea. Um, so they, they had a flag called minus A. Uh, so now you can just do stop minus A and then W means wait. So it waits for a VM to shut down and then it will do the next one. Um, so that was quite annoying. Starting VMs is still annoying. They're fixing that. So the idea in 6.7 is that you can run start all whatever, and it will do four at a time, and then wait, and then four at a time, um, which I don't think is still a great idea, especially when the machine crashed and you have to wait for FS check. So I have one in the good condition, sleep 30, and one in bad condition, when the machine crashed, I do 90. Um, so then at least I give enough time for the, the FS check to finish, um, so it's not impacting, or it doesn't, if, you, if I don't do this, Booting of some VMs will take hours, which is not fun. Um, another thing which was uh, trial and error. Um, um, in the beginning, there were some connectivity issues. Um, I started investigating. They're not done yet. Um, but one of the things was the ARP queue of OpenBSD by default is set to 50. So if you have 40 VMs or 50 VMs and you're in a broadcast of a slash 24, you get errors and drops and things like that. So I, I increased it to 1,024, and that, for some time, fixed the connectivity problems. Um, so what user experience? Uh, one of the very interesting things, which I have to admit Linux has solved, is clock drift in a virtual machine. Um, it can be quite severe if the machine has boot up and it couldn't get enough megahertz from the CPU, then you could have like five uh, or, or yeah, five minutes um, off within quick. Um, if you run Alpine, for example, I have one Alpine VM, uh, um, the guy has to sync the clock every second. 
Yes. So that, that yeah. Um, they are aware, but everybody goes. And I have a, 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 a nice page on, on the website, clock.html. Um, one of the main developers has like this long uh, essay about why it all sucks and that it's a very hard problem to fix. Uh, and yes, Linux has fixed the problem. Uh, but it's, it's one of the things everybody goes, yeah, 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 we have to do it, but no one wants to do it. Um, another thing, um, especially in the beginning, I've got a lot of uh, questions about this. For some reason, there's a high interrupt rate, and it's just to do with how the interrupts are handled in VM. Um, nothing to see here, move along, but it's still, uh, people still find it, I find it annoying. Um, then there's still s some connectiv no, no, severe connectivity issues. Uh, um, the interesting part is that it doesn't really matter if there's a lot of VMs running on a host or not a lot. I'm seeing it on machines that have like 6 and 40 and everything in between. Um, and the only stable way that I figured out to fix this is to run this command at reboot in your cron um, that does every 5 seconds, well, clock drift every 10 seconds, uh, a ping to the, to the gateway. Um, I thought this was in Bridge. Uh, during EuroBSDCon, if people know it, it's an event every year that is held uh, uh, with just a lot of BSD nerds. Um, and, and we really thought it was the bridge that was causing the problem. So initially, I had a layer 2 setup. Is Attila still here? <laughs> Good. Attila likes layer 3. Uh, it's a layer 2 setup where I have a public interface in the private bridge, and then all the VMs are also in that, in that bridge. Um, so someone said, okay, let's do a routed setup. So I have a private bridge, and I route all the traffic out uh, through uh, the public interface. But right away, I saw that there were a lot of problems as well. So someone said, okay, yeah, do some packet traces. And I hadn't seen Sake's presentation about Wireshark yet. So I had a lot of different files that I go had to go through because I had to do a lot of different tabs and V-Ethers and whatever. Um, because the idea was that certain broadcast or R packets were not answered correctly or were leaving the wrong interface. Now, I think we have proven that that is not the case. And now I've really stumped the OpenBees developers because they have no clue where it's now at. Um, so this is where we where we are. Um, another thing, what I've seen, what you might have seen, is unresponsive VMs. For some reason, the VM can just take 100% of uh, CPU, and it will just go oh, hanging there. Um, that is hopefully now fixed in 6.7. Um, so one way, or the only way, to actually make that go away is to do a kill minus 9. Um, VM, uh, VM control stop minus F, force that you can do as a user doesn't cut it. Um, so people said, yeah, can we do that now as well? So what I've done is actually, that is where the DoS configuration comes in. So every user has a permit, no pass, basically means you can run this command without a password, and you can kill your VM. I had to test that first a couple of times uh, so that you could not kill other VMs. Um, but that, that's then the command that you, uh, that you can run. So do as pkill uh, minus 9 minus F and then your, uh, your VM ID. And that works quite well. And if I see it, I'll do that for my users. Uh, so if you say, hey, my VM rebooted, that's probably the reason. Um, one other thing, um, the last part actually, is um, I've also had people that wanted to do redundancy. So they want to have a VM on server 2 and a VM on server 8 and then have uh, uh, redundancy between them. Now there's two ways that you can do redundancy is with layer 2. Um, and OpenBSD has a nice VRP, a free VRP version called CARP. Um, and that you can actually do in the VM if they're in the same broadcast domain. So if they're in the same layer, uh, uh, layer 2 subnet slash 24. Uh, on VM1 you can run that command um, which basically tells you here's my IP address, this is the, uh, the virtual ID, um, you can give it a password, Cisco for example, um, and what your, your um, uh, CARB device is, so the, the, the actual public interface. And then you'd have to, you have to tell it, because for some reason Bridge doesn't send these packets uh, uh, to each other. You have to do this on um, IP, so you have to tell it, this is my peer. And on the other side you have to point it to the other direction. 
Um, so I do this on, on uh, some hosts. So my relay D uh, setup runs like this. My DNS setup runs like this. Um, but if you want, you can also do this with layer three, um, which is what I wanted to do because people said, yeah, you have to go route it. And I went, shit, but then how do I do my failover? Um, so enter relay day. Um, and the nice thing with relay D is that you can do health check on from this. This you have to do from the host. So if you would want to do this, I have to do that for you. Um, you can do a health check on a host, and based on that health check, Relay D can talk to BGP, and it can say, "Hey, inject this B this IP address in your BGP table," um, which is what you see on the left side. So the left side is the Relay D config. Um, so I have the VM that I health check. And then the route is basically the IP address that I push into uh, BGP. And then the health check script is below that because it has to give, uh, you have to give a certain uh, error code back. Um, and then on the right side is the BGP config of the host, which then ta talks to my router that says here. Here's an IP address that has to go to myself because I have a host here. And then on the other host, you can do something similar and you give it some metrics and things like that. Um, so that's the, the, the layer three uh, comic that I played with. And based on this is actually how I started investigating the connectivity issues. Because my RelayD would say, hey, for the last 10 minutes, I cannot reach this VM that's on the same host in the same freaking bridge. Um, but anyway. So that was the, the, the setup. So I do have a wish list uh, uh, that people agree, for example, that PXC would be a good thing so that I can completely automate the whole process without TCL, um, everybody would prefer no clock drift, um, and then I still have to tackle the, the connectivity drops, which is just a hard problem. Anyway, um, so some people that have been working on this, I've done this at EuroBSDCon and all these people were in the room, so that makes a little bit more impact, sorry. Um, but the nice thing is, based on all the stuff that I've been doing, um, I got an email yesterday from one of the, the, the like, the kernel guys that says, hey, there's like a little problem in VM. Uh, um, here's a patch uh, that's coming. Um, so apparently, there's now a vulnerability where from the host, no, sorry, from the VM, you can DDoS the host. So please don't do this. Uh, after I patched, you can try. Um, but I've, I've now got the patch that I can uh, apply already before it comes into like a, a pr proper uh, sys patch. Um, and the last time we counted, there were 47 uh, uh, people working on VMM, VMD. Um, and the interesting part was we started also counting the commits. And Ori, um, who did the QCOW2 uh, image, I think he did five commits. And Mike Larkin, who's the main VMM developer, he went, how did he do that? That's impossible. But apparently it works. Anyway, just some side note. Um, so thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Um, I have some, some links here. I also have them without the logo, so it's easier to read. I can publish the, the, the slides so you can actually click on them. Um, but anyway, any questions? All clear? Tired? Yes. Set them on the first hand. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I think it works. Yes. No, uh, my question was, uh, um, well, for me, the news for OpenBSD M stand was that there was actually a hypervisor for OpenBSD. That was the reason why I got my VM. Perfect. Uh, 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 do you know of other people doing projects similar to this one? Or, uh, are, you, or are, you, uh, are you the only testing ground for this? I think I'm the only major testing ground. A lot of the OpenBSD developers are using this before a very specific use case. for. So if people are Mastodon, um, there's BSD.network, uh, which is an instance on the hypervisor, but I think it's the only instance. So they're not seeing, uh, every time I go, so everybody el anybody else seeing this problem? No. Um, people have approached me to do this, but where, it get, where they go wrong is either IP space or traffic or power or combination thereof. The nice thing is I, I have a, a co-location company uh, for a long time. I have Rackspace, I've got power, uh, traffic at access roll currently is not a problem. 
Um, so for me, it was very easy to, to do this. If you do this in like a standard co-location facility, it's a little bit trickier because the, the cost, also the amount of money that I asked for for a VM is, is quite low. And the reason why I do this is not to make money. Um, I just want this the thing to run on its own and, and that I can donate. Um, so it's, I think it, to do this at a, at a, at a scale, it, it's quite tricky to do. Um, but during uh, the EuroBSD con, uh, uh, Reich, oops, uh, Reich Fluter, um, he actually uh, uh, grabbed the mic and said, this is great, please start doing this, because that's the only way that this thing becomes uh, better. Um, so if you have some spare hardware, uh, uh, start deploying and, and playing with it. Was it all clear, or no one cares, or just? <laughs> 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 yeah, all right. That's fair. Were people expecting the other Misha? Could also be the case. Okay, thank you.